Can the people in the back of the room hear me pretty well? And I'm not hopefully blasting out the people in the front. Great. OK. So, uh, so what we're going to be talking about is we talk about a little bit in context of just mobile development in general. So how many, just raise your hands, how many people actively do mobile development, uh, you know, say for your job or a significant amount? A couple of hands. How many people are here to sort of learn about mobile development or you can, okay, that's good. Geez, so good. A new audience. I, I think I'll at least cover some of that. So I'll talk about you know, my experience a little bit, which was you know, going back a few years ago, and then how some of the things have changed, and then where OpenShift sort of fits into this. But oh, let me get my slides here. I, a little bit about me. So my name's Matt Hicks. I actually started, was one of the original members of the OpenShift team. So I know OpenShift pretty well. Work on OpenShift, also Red Hat employee for a long time. So I've been at Red Hat for, this will be my seventh year. And in terms of Red Hat years, that's a pretty long time at Red Hat. So old Linux guy, spend a lot of time doing cloud development and OpenShift development these days. Uh, that's my Twitter handle, although it's a pretty silent stream. So if you follow me on Twitter, you're not going to see too much. But hopefully it's meaningful when I put it out there. But first, let's talk about my experience with mobile development. And this goes back about probably about four years or so. And, and I started learning mobile development just because I wanted to learn iOS development. It's a neat space. Uh, you know, Apple is launching their app marketplace. You know, just as a developer, it was something I wanted to dig into and learn more about. But my background is pretty much, I had spent the last 10 years prior doing Java development. And yeah, I like Java development. I'd done C prior to that and a lot of other you know, things through school. But I'd spent a lot of time in Java. And so the shift for me, going from doing Java day in and day out to developing code for an iPhone was pretty different. And the first thing, how many Java developers in the room do we have? It's JudCon. So OK, good. So you guys might appreciate this one. Because the first thing for us was memory management. Like Java makes you. Yeah, I love Java, but it makes you pretty dumb on memory management. You know, and actually going back to a language where you're counting references and you're having to do very manual memory management was it was different. I enjoyed it, but it was different. It was a it was relearning stuff that I hadn't really touched on too much for about a decade. The second challenge is Xcode. So how many people actually know what Xcode is? I see a lot of uh, Mac laptops. I was an Eclipse guy. And the shift between Eclipse and Xcode is pretty significant. I mean, that, that actually, to me, took me a longer period of time to learn Xcode than it really did to get back in the, uh, the habit of, of not losing you know, memory references and, and churning there. Third thing was just learning a new language. And languages are something that I like as a technologist. I learn languages pretty regularly. But it was a big hit. You know, Objective-C is it's a very different language than Java. There's some similarities there. It's probably you know, not as close to something like C, but it's certainly not as uh, it's a much more manual aspect, especially when you're programming to devices. You're really dealing with things that you don't deal with on a desktop computer of the size of an image you load into memory may or may not work. You might crash your device. Just lots and lots of things there. That, that was the part that I was interested in. I wanted to get into device development. I found it fascinating to do development on a tiny iPhone and see how much that could do. But these were the challenges that I hit that, not that I didn't enjoy it, but it really it delayed the process. So what this meant was what we started with was we're essentially going to make a note card application. And you know, there are, it sounds stupid, but if you go back four years, that was a hot thing to make in the Apple uh, marketplace. And so we were going to learn this. And we actually ended up partnering with another company to use their content for it, because we didn't want to do a bunch of content generation. This was just a good, tangible experience for us to learn iPhone development. And it took three months. And this was a lot of nights. This was a lot of weekends of a relatively simple application. I mean, you can still go look and see the application today. But it was an extreme. We spent an extreme amount of time learning the environment, learning how to code, learning the language, learning a lot of different things just to get our idea off the ground. And this is a powerful thing. We love that marketplace. But it, 
going back now is how do you take those three months down to the two weeks that it really should have been? Because that, that's the velocity that it moves at right now. You can't spend three months getting a new idea into the market because uh, you know, there will be 20 other ones there by that time. So then the second thing that hit for us was this application goes out. It's a tinker toy thing for us, just a project to really prove that we learned it. And the app actually became fairly popular. And so now we were in a really stuck spot. It's like we're doing stuff nights and weekends. We really don't care about it. We're sort of done with this. And now the company that we got that content from is saying, hey, guys, there's this second marketplace, and you need to be there. And yeah, this was a little bit awkward because you're like, oh, actually, this is just a project for us, and we're sort of we're done with this. Because for us to get into the Android marketplace, it was the same thing all over again, right? You know, it's a different SDKs, it's a different language, it's a different environment. And it was something that, you know, we'd gotten the whole device programming thing out of our system now, and it wasn't possible to take something that was becoming pretty popular and actually move it to another marketplace in a click, which would have been ideal. Would have made them happy, would have made us happy. It really wasn't going to happen. So that's, you know, it was painful for us. And the nice part is this is going back four years. And actually going to now, a lot of things have changed in the marketplace, which make this a lot easier. So the first thing is if we look at something like Titanium Studio. So how many people have played with, and there are a couple different offerings in the market. Does anyone know about Accelerator or Titanium Studio? OK, there are a couple, few hands in the audience. So the nice things about this for me, I wish this was there. Because one, it's Eclipse-based. So it's, as a Java developer, familiar environment for me. Two, it was JavaScript-based. And so most, a lot of Java development, you're still doing web applications. So you are, I mean, most people are familiar with JavaScript at least. It's a little bit more natural than the shift to Objective-C. So those two nice parts, but the best part about it is you're able to write in JavaScript a mobile application. They do the device emulations, but then when you want to ship the application, they actually compile it down to the native platform. So they'll compile to iOS, or they'll compile to Android, or they'll compile to, um, I think, RIM, BlackBerry, although probably not as compelling a marketplace there. But the first two are really, you know, you want to be in both of those. And so there are products there that actually really ease that learning curve, because you're not moving in a big gap in languages. You're staying in a familiar toolkit. And yet you're getting most of the benefit, too. And it's, it's not perfect. Um, you know, I hear, and Grant has done more development of this than I have. But there is, you know, you might hit 5% of stuff that's not going to work or that would be specific. So if you were doing, like, the next generation game, you're probably still going to step down to native development. But if you're just trying to get your idea into the marketplace, this is a great place to start. So that's one of the things that's changed. And a nice part about Titanium Studio is it's actually integrated with OpenShift. So question there is, like in my story, and I think in a lot of mobile stories, it's why the heck do I need the cloud to do mobile development? Because mobile development four years ago was really, it was what you could get on that device. Um, in fact, those of you who know the Apple story, Apple started off where apps couldn't be larger than 10 megs that shipped out of the Apple marketplace. And if you think of 10 megs, that's, that's nothing these days. I mean, that's like a handful of images. You're at 10 megs now. And so Apple then moved that limit from 10 to 100. And then they started to introduce things like in-app purchases because the size of apps were, I mean, they were exploding. Now you can go over Wi-Fi, pull down like a gig or two application that's on there. But Where's the cloud come into this? So if that was four years ago, was what could you get on the device? This has really changed now. And there were some companies, if you think of, uh, if you know the company Smool was one of them that actually started this, where mobile applications really became social. Uh, applications started to get connected, where it wasn't about what was on your device, but it was your device communicating with other devices and being able to pass that data back and forth. And so our other painful part of our story with this was once our application started getting popular, the company told us, they're like, look, we don't want you shipping this content onto the phone. What we want to do is you create a subscription service for us. We're going to hold all the content on the server side, and we're going to farm that out to the devices under a subscription, and it's going to be great. And we had two painful conversations. It was like, one, guys, we told you this was a project. We're out. We don't have time for this. But the second one was we didn't want to be spinning up machines in Amazon and paying for those machines or you know, 
spinning up our own servers and dealing with bandwidth contracts and those things to be able to deliver this content. Because the minute you go into a server side environment, you're going to spend more time maintaining that environment than you're going to spend tinkering with the code. And if you're somebody like me, I mean, our enjoyment was really tinkering with the code. It wasn't maintaining servers. It wasn't looking at the actual um, you know, distribution environment. So with that, that bridges me a little bit into the OpenShift side. Because if you look at what we're trying to do on OpenShift, we are trying, whether it's Java or whether it's PHP or whether it's Ruby, pick your language of choice. We're trying to give you a managed environment, tool sets that are familiar to you, where Red Hat it's backed by Red Hat. Our operational teams watch these things where we can take over the maintenance aspect of you. So if you had an environment like that where you just needed to publish files to it, have those files go out connected to 1,000 or 10,000 uh, mobile phones, it becomes a really simple experience for you to spin up the server side aspect of that, especially if you're doing the client side development in something like um, AppCelerator's Titanium Studio. So with that, let's actually go through this, uh, this video. Apologize again, short notice for me here. So uh, luckily I had this screenshot and we will see how this does. How many people have actually gone through the OpenShift process before I go? Can determine how fast I talk. So two, three, handful in the room. Okay, I'm gonna go through this pretty quick. Uh, what I'm gonna walk through is OpenShift has, we try pretty hard to make ubiquitous access to it. So if you are an Eclipse developer, we have great Eclipse tooling. Max, I didn't see Max in here. Uh, but we have our Eclipse team does very native Eclipse integration. That's what I'm going to show you here. So if you don't like to leave Eclipse, you can do everything in OpenShift from Eclipse. We also, everything you do in Eclipse is going to be visible on the command line. A very standard, you know, RHC space, command space, just like Git. Uh, and you can also go through the web interface to get this stuff. So now we're going to move into how would we stand up that server environment and what would that what would that look like? How fast is it? So okay, so this is the Clips ID. You guys are probably very familiar with this. Let's do table stake stuff. File new OpenShift application. You can go in, pick your application type, pick your gear size and pick any embeddable cartridges that you want. So I'm going to try to pause this here. Great. So let's talk about embeddable cartridges. Because when we talk about a server-side environment, it usually doesn't stop with JBoss or stop with Rails. You want Rails and you want Mongo, or you want JBoss and you want MySQL, or you might want JBoss and Mongo and Rock Mongo to manage it. But there are a lot of supplementary software that you want in addition to your web interface. That's where cartridges come in for us. So as you can see here, everything from turning on cron support to being able to do proxying to integrating with Jenkins, getting extra metrics, Mongo, MySQL, check a box, and we'll spin those up for you as well. So we'll go through here. I think I check Mongo and then uncheck it. Click Next. Use all the defaults, hit finish. Real quick, it's going to create. So it takes a while for DNS usually to go through here. It's going to clone this locally, and then you're actually going to see an Eclipse project. So we'll expand this, and I created a JBoss application. So what you're going to see here is a pretty much like a traditional Hello World application. Just standard JSP, Hello World, you'll see index.html, Snoop JSP. So we'll look at this index.html. I've got the title there. I'll scroll down. If you launch this server and do show in web browser, this is actually, when you go through this, this is live. So a great part about OpenShift for mobile development is if you've done mobile development and you've tried to get your phone to see local host on your laptop, it is an extremely challenging thing to do. It can be done through like network craziness, but it, it is an absolute pain. Nice part about OpenShift is this URL, from the minute you create this, this is worldwide publicly available. So if you actually want to see how your application is going to serve data over the internet to your phone, it's a great way to get that started and not have to just do device emulation. So this is live now for once you've gone through that process. And we'll actually go through changing it real quick. So I think what I do go through here is change this to welcome to my paths. 
and there's one-click publishing. So if you're not too familiar with Git, right-clicking on this and then um, clicking the publish command will actually take all your changes. It'll commit them. It'll push them up. And then those changes will be live. So that's your way to get data back and forth. It's a really nice, fast development environment. Let's see if I can pause again. So what you're going to see here is because I chose JBoss, this is a Maven environment. So we actually just did a package here because all we changed was a file in index.html. But you could have changed arbitrarily complicated things. It would have recompiled them. It would have repackaged them, redeployed them. You can choose whether you want to do hot deployments, really nice for development, or whether you want to force bounce everything and reload it. But once that is done, uh, going back to your application live, you're going to see that it's updated. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm showing you the package command that we run. And the nice part about this, it's a fast development. It's a fast iterative environment. If you want to, you're changing things on your mobile phone, you want to see how that service responds, you can push, and then it's live there immediate for you. Open this up. All right. And you can see that it's changed live. And so you guys, I would actually recommend, like, go through this process today. You can find me. If something doesn't work, come find me, or I don't see Juan here, and yell at us. Because we can probably get this stuff. If you're hitting problems with it, we'll go through it. We love getting user input on it. We've been doing this for the last year. Um, so if you hit problems or things that are clunky, come grab us while we're here. But you can see, this is the goal, right? Open up Eclipse. We make our change, whether we're changing a class file to a REST service that's pushing data differently to our phone, or we're changing the web interface of it. It's change, commit, push, and it's live. Now, we'll actually go through the second part, which is debugging. Because when I talk with people about this, they're usually very skeptical about server environments. Because, like, yeah, that's cool. But uh, just like debugging, you know, just like connecting my mobile phone to localhost is a pain, debugging on a remote server is a pain. Now, the one thing I will agree, it's slower uh, when you're going to a remote server, but we tried to make this really easy. So debugging basically involves two things. One is you put this marker file called enable JPDA. So you have to, we don't turn it on by default. If you put a file there, we will turn that on. The second thing you do is, and this is from our Eclipse team, clicking on this, going to OpenShift and port forwarding, you'll actually see it's going to create an SSH tunnel, take every port that's on the server, forward them through that tunnel to your local box. You'll see 8787 is there. Click Start All and you're connected. So now everything you do on your local server is going to go over an SSH tunnel to the remote host. We'll actually see this. So now I can go connect to 127.0.0.1.87.87, just like I was on my local box. Um, granted, you're doing a remote Java application instead of a local one. But uh, with that, we can open up a JSP. We can put a breakpoint in it, which I'll actually go through here. We can pull this application up, hit it. And it will stop. It'll switch it to your debug view. You can go through everything. So you basically get a server-side environment here where you can debug. You can play things out. Um, and just in the power of, of having it, it local. So we saw it was connected. I'm going to go put a uh, breakpoint line here. Then we'll pull up the browser. That same live, I'll see if I can stop it here when I bring it up. OK, so notice this is still my live application. Like This is a, a public, accessible application. It's running in Amazon's environment. And we're just going to debug this just like it was on our local machine. So type in snoop.jsp, and you're going to see this actually hit the debug view. Um, and I'll point at some of the environment variables. You know, it's, if you know Java debugging, it's very, very natural environment. So broke, you can see variables here. You can play it out, and then it's going to show the traditional you know, Snoop JSP page. So now the nice part about this, I'll start talking ahead of the video a little bit, is the context if you're not an IDE guy. Do we have any script people in here? I'm a scripting guy. So OK, we've at least got three. I saw three hands. So this next part of the presentation is for you. Uh, we worked very hard to take this same context and information architecture you're going to see in Eclipse. We don't want to make. You know, the people that like to work in the command line or through the web interface to exclude them. So you're going to see uh, 
that next. Also, the nice part from that same fancy server, you could tail files remotely on your server. Just like you were tailing a file locally on your box, you'll see it in your console log. You could go get environment variables. Basically, anything you would on your local machine, you can work with the remote machine just like you could. So you get the power of a publicly accessible server for mobile development, but then you can operate with it like it's running on your local laptop. So now, we're going to run from the command line and show that this basic structure is the same. I have my password hidden there. We'll see my application, the same structure that's there. It's a JBoss application. Uh, these commands are pretty powerful. So if you went to like RHC app, you can do anything that's happening through Eclipse through the command line as well. If you went into our web interface, click Manager Applications, you're going to see the same structure, same topology. It'll be very familiar to you. So the goal with that, and if you go into Titanium Studio, it's, they're using our same Java client. It's going to be extremely similar. So whatever tool sets you come from, whatever you're most comfortable with, we try to make the server side a little bit invisible to that. Um, and then this is just the eye candy part, because it wasn't meant for this audience. But as this UI changes, you can see that it's a responsive UI. So as you actually close your browser, um, it will move to a mobile layout. And so that was something mobile is, mobile is something that, that we're very passionate about. We think responsive UIs are key for that, because if you're interacting with OpenShift on your mobile device, we want the same website to be able to change and restructure itself to make sense from a mobile layout or from a tablet layout or from a desktop layout. But with that, that's about all the content that I have, unfortunately. So uh, can I open it up for, um, for questions? Sir? You can. I'll, I'll touch it. So the question was, can we have different, can you have different deployment environments on OpenShift? And we'll talk about this actually a little later in Summit, but I'll give a quick overview of how we structure the OpenShift environment. So for free, we bucket resource units into what we call gears. And so for free, you get three gears. You can do with them basically whatever you want. You can put cartridges on the same gear, or you can split cartridges across gears. So you might want to have Mongo on one, your app on the other. But what we see a lot of is some people will have a dev and a stage and a prod gear, and that's what they use their three gears for. And it's based on Git. So it's fairly easy to actually have three different remotes and then move code from environments. But we try to keep that, we sort of try to stay out of the way in that business. If we let you snapshot applications and restore them, so you can have a lot of flexibility between moving data between gears and just moving the code aspects between them, too. Did that answer? OK, <laughs> cool. OK, that's, so I know there are actually quite a few OpenShift presentations. So if you're interested in the, like, the geeky behind the scenes sort of stuff, uh, Mike McGrath and Brett, I think I saw Brett in the audience. Yeah, he's back there talking about that. Juan and I will be talking about the roadmap later on Thursday, so we'll get into um, gears and all sorts of things there. Just saw one other hand. I think it was in the front. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> um, sure. Uh huh. It is. So the question was, um, we use Jenkins for continuous integration. And can I summarize it basically? How does Jenkins work with that? that fair enough. So, so I think my answer will answer your question. Of, so Jenkins for us, when, we, when you pick the Jenkins client, actually, we take one gear and we make a Jenkins master on that. And we, out of the box, you get a Jenkins master. And when it needs slaves, it'll use gears for those slaves. But that Jenkins master is yours. You have the admin user and password for it. You can install any plugins you want onto Jenkins. We obviously try to have sort of a good default that's working with whatever your, your, your language environment is. And we sway that a little bit towards Java. But it's you fully own the Jenkins master there. And mainly what we do is the sort of the magic setup of when you get pushed to it that we move your code out to the Jenkins machine, do your builds for you, move the code back for deployment. Uh, 
Um, but again, it's that same model of as long as you don't break those scripts of how we shuttle code back and forth, you can customize Jenkins as much as you want. Sir? Okay, so I'm an old IT guy, actually. So I can give you a couple of answers to that. And it, it's, it is, yeah, I talk with customers a lot. It's probably the biggest complication right now with public cloud environments is data regulation. So there, there are a couple of things. The, um, the most popular connectivity that we actually use ourselves is securing SSH channels back into, or sorry, SSL channel. So being able to do HTTP with custom X509 certificates out of the VPN-ish space, but people are really starting to trust being able to do HTTP connectivity back and then securing it over SSL. So we're seeing more and more of that, but it doesn't get you into like the block level. Like, how do I do an NFS mount into that? I, I don't think that's actually going to happen for a while, to be honest. Um, what we do see a lot of is customers putting data in sources like S3 or using the block storage on OpenShift itself. So what we do on OpenShift just openly is so we have, um, we're much more on each gear has its non-clustered storage space so that um, almost like a sharded storage space. And so it doesn't work for everybody and we're going to expand that, but that's where we are today uh, just because there are a lot of you know, clustered or big pool storage space in the market like Amazon S3. But, but that's a really tough one. I mean, that's what we do, the SSL approach. Uh, the NFS mounting type thing is, is difficult for a lot of reasons. And, uh, but yeah, it requires sort of like transit of data up, I think, to be really successful there. Any like testing my mobile knowledge? That, uh, I hope you don't take me off on that. Connecting back? Uh, that's actually pretty popular. So we, we make sure, so the one note to the audience is we do block some things. It's a multi-tenant environment. And so if you hit problems, JDBC is one that we know very well works because a lot of people do that, where moving a big iron DB into the public cloud probably not going to happen. Moving your application tier out and then being able to connect back into sort of a more on-premise database is something that we see a lot more of, because that's probably the hardest data to move is you know, your relational data. So connecting out to databases, remote connections, JDBC, and protocols like that work. Um, if you try something and it doesn't work, let us know. And as we go through, we whitelist any protocols that, um, you know, that aren't malicious things that are occurring. So the Accelerator integration takes your simulated development environment. So Accelerator is broken into your essentially your client code and your server code. So they've taken the model that the days of client-only mobile development are essentially gone. And almost all mobile development is going to have a, a device aspect, and they're going to have a server side aspect to it. Um, Accelerator, obviously, the client aspect is in JavaScript. You can do that simulation part. The server aspect, you can code that right next to your client, and then one button, publish that server aspect to OpenShift so you can test it against live systems. So very similar to what you saw in the JBoss tooling, except instead of just a free form project, it's coupled to your client code in Accelerator. But the nice part is you know, the, the actual client tools that are running this are all open source. Uh, I don't know if Bill DeCoste is here, but Bill and Xavier and a lot of the guys here have helped build that. And so the same underpinning capabilities are there, which is why you see a lot of similarities between them. How you would connect your device emulators out would be over, yeah, over HTTP to those remote sites. So I know in Accelerator you have that choice of are you connecting to local hosts because they can emulate it all on one machine? Or do you want to, when you do an OpenShift deployment, do you want to connect it out to your public um, URL, which you can test through an emulated device, you know, which would show the phone on your desktop, or you could publish test code to your actual device and then test it as well because it's publicly available. 
uh, through App Accelerator. You can publish to your device, and if you've done your server side on OpenShift, your device can actually reach it over the, uh, the internet. Did I answer? Was that? Okay. <laughs> Good. Great. Did I do a not terrible job picking this up 15 minutes prior? I hope. <laughs> so apologies for that, Ms. Shuffle, but thank you guys very much. <laughs>